Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Vinay Nard Carney. Dr. Nard Carney is the Endowed Chair of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Vinay, uh, welcome. Thank you. Vinay, um, around the world, uh, you are respected by your colleagues uh, for the research that you've done over the past several decades in resuscitation. And I know I probably speak for many um, when I say, could you begin by describing, um, you know, what do we know about resuscitation science, um, and 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 how can we put what we've learned into practice? Well, Jeff, I really think it's all about um, resuscitating resuscitation and embedding research into practice every day. There are only a few things that we really know work in cardiac arrest resuscitation, and uh, the chain of survival is very simple for most patients. So getting people to act and act well is really the key to all of resuscitation. There are special resuscitation circumstances that cause us to deviate from what the average person might need to do to resuscitate a patient. And so uh, although we have algorithms and we have sort of sequences of medications and treatments that we use, it's important to know when to leave that algorithm and thoughtfully intervene with a, a different approach. Finai, um, you are on ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee for Resuscitation. You are active in the American Heart Association. And I know you've reviewed the evidence uh, recently in the last few years, and the guidelines have changed a little bit. Could you take us through that? Yeah, it's really interesting and exciting. Um, for instance, the ABCs, giving epinephrine, using 100% oxygen, uh, stopping CPR after 20 minutes of cardiac arrest resuscitation. Those are all things that really were embedded in our algorithms for many, many years. And with recent data, and really data mining and the ill core process of evidence evaluation, we sort of discovered that uh, the American Heart Association and ill core no longer really recommend for all patients to start with an ABC. They start with C for circulation. And in addition, when we think about 100% oxygen, particularly for neonates, we no longer recommend resuscitation that starts with 100% oxygen and paying close attention in the post-resuscitation phase to avoiding hyperoxia rather than just willy-nilly uh, administering 100% oxygen. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now with epinephrine. You know that we went through a phase where we're giving high-dose epinephrine frequently uh, and uh, then evidence came forward from some of our studies in Latin America and with careful sort of ferreting out that routine use of high-dose epinephrine was actually harmful, not helpful. And now, even going further, some emerging evidence in adults that perhaps epinephrine might not be needed at all. When you say high-dose uh, epinephrine, you're referring to 1 to 1,000 concentration. That's right. So usually we're talking about 10 micrograms per kilogram as the usual or standard dose. But the use of second and subsequent doses of high-dose, 10 times that much, 100 micrograms per kilogram, that dose was associated not with better outcome, but actually with worse outcome in some long-term survivors who were unfavorable neurologic outcomes. Now, when we think about the things that really uh, matter, uh, we're lacking tools. Max Harry Weil, a very famous critical care uh, founder of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, used to say that performing CPR without measuring the effects is like flying an airplane without an altimeter. No dials, nothing to guide you. But we do have a few dials. We have, in the ICU setting, sometimes diastolic blood pressure, greater than 30 millimeters of mercury. That's very helpful. End tidal CO2 of greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, very helpful. Even now, some of these uh, quality of CPR monitors telling us that our depth greater than 50 millimeters, our rate greater than 100 beats per minute, and uh, no interruptions of greater than 10 seconds are all associated with better survival outcomes. Jeff, these are simple things. They're not hard to do. They're sort of right in front of us, but we don't do it very often. In fact, in our ICU at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a pretty good ICU, we thought we were doing a really great job. We were training in PALS, Pediatric Advanced Life Support, and making sure that everybody was trained every two years as was recommended. And we would run mock codes and we would really pay attention 
But when we actually measured what we did with some of these quality of CPR devices in our monitor and defibrillator, we discovered that more than a third of the time during real resuscitations, we were not achieving a deep, a deep enough depth of chest compression. We were not achieving greater than 100 compressions per minute, and we were interrupting frequently. Those things were affecting the quality of CPR, and when we fixed them, we doubled the survival from cardiac arrest in the hospital. Vinay, um, that's a very clear uh, overview of the changes in the guidelines. Um, I wonder if I could ask you uh, for some clarification. The um, compression uh, as the, uh, the first step uh, is for adults in the community environment. And for our colleagues in the PICU environment, is it ABC? That's a really good point, Jeff. Um, the American Heart Association and ILCOR recommended CAB, or compressions, airway breathing, as a sequence, particularly for the layperson, for somebody who's not sophisticated, and for those that they want really to incite to action, do something. And if you do that one something, it should be compressions. However, in the ICU setting, in the pediatric ICU, and for children in general, airway and breathing are exceedingly important. And what we know from some studies from Kitamura, published in, uh, in Lancet, that when you look at a population Breathing, airway and breathing are still essentially important for kids. That the survival outcome from cardiac arrest with compressions with rescue breathing, the outcome was better than chest compressions alone. So the adage or the, the algorithm now is to start with compressions so that we don't delay compressions in order to get ventilations in. But what's really important is that the combination should be done for children. Compressions, airway, and breathing. Now we know that the primary etiology of cardiac arrest the world over for children is primarily respiratory leading to cardiac arrest. And therefore that pre-arrest time period becomes exceedingly important. Whether you're on a ventilator or not, interrupting a cycle of hypoxia and ischemia, which then lead to bradycardia and asphyxia is exceedingly important. And perhaps our best opportunity to resuscitate once chest compressions, once pulseless cardiac arrest has happened, then circulating blood, oxygenated or not, becomes the primary objective. And so their chest compressions and good quality chest compressions become so much more important. Dr. Narkani, I wonder if I could ask you a question um, about your practice as you interpret the literature. You're trying to monitor the quality of resuscitation, in particular the quality of cardiac compressions. Um, if I gave you the choice of uh, monitoring the depth of compressions or diastolic blood pressure or end tidal CO2 capnography, uh, if I gave you those three alternatives, which in your mind at the bedside is the best practical, reliable measure of the quality of chest compressions that's going on in that patient at that time? That's a really good question. Any one of the three are better than nothing at all. That's clear. But if I had my preference, and we actually had to go to the pig lab to figure this out, was that in the hierarchy of what's best, good, and okay, diastolic arterial blood pressure, greater than 30, rules. And that's what I would use if I had it. About 60% of our uh, cardiac arrests that occur in the United States uh, have arterial catheters in place at the time of arrest. So in about 60% of our patients, we could follow and goal direct our resuscitation to that diastolic blood pressure. In the absence of that, the next best would be end tidal CO2. We know that end tidal CO2 of less than 10 is associated with extremely poor resuscitation outcome, failure to return spontaneous circulation. Above 15, you start to get into the range where the return of spontaneous circulation is much better and statistically better. So we titrate if we don't have an arterial line to end tidal CO2. Worst of all, but important if you have it, are quality measures that you can get anatomically, depth of compression, rate of compression, chest compression fraction, the, time, the duration that you are not interrupting chest compressions, in other words. And those are good, but the best would be diastolic blood pressure. And let me just take a moment because we weren't sure which one was best. So we, went, we have a pig lab of asphyxial and ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest that we recently published in Critical Care Medicine. And what we did was we took a group of anesthetized pigs and piglets, and we induced either asphyxia, 
or sudden ventricular cardiac arrest. And we either guided the resuscitation to a diastolic blood pressure of 30, to an end tidal CO2 of greater than 15, or to a depth of compression as currently recommended greater than 50 millimeters. And we found out that the re receiver operator curve, the, the um, prediction of return of spontaneous circulation was best with diastolic blood pressure, second best with end tidal CO2, and worst with our crude measures of the anatomy of chest compressions. Interesting. We wonder now if we could turn to our colleagues around the world and ask a question. Could you first state your city and country location? And the question is this, do you routinely use end tidal CO2 capnography to monitor the quality of resuscitation at your PICU? We're back now with Dr. Nard Carney. Uh, Vinay, um, what is the state of the research on uh, whether quality matters in a resuscitation? Um, does, is there evidence that it actually leads to differences in outcome? So uh, we don't really have a ton of data uh, across multiple ICUs about how the quality affects outcome. But we have a lot of adult data, and we have some single center uh, resuscitation data in the pediatric ICU. And what it tells us is that um, without monitoring devices, without monitoring the quality of chest compressions in particular, that we do a pretty lousy job, that only about two-thirds of the time are we achieving uh, the metrics that the, uh, the guidelines recommend. Uh, depth greater than 50 millimeters, heart rate greater than 100, uh, ventilation rate 10 or less per minute, and uh, a full release of the chest in between compressions and uh, minimal interruptions, less than 10 seconds interruptions. So we know that, uh, particularly in my unit, that um, we only achieve that about two-thirds of the time without guidance. And even when monitoring that, with the different monitors we talked about before, diastolic blood pressure and tidal CO2, or even the depth of CPR, that until we started debriefing on that with the team immediately after and then quantitatively afterwards with the whole team, that we actually then were able to improve the quality of CPR with more than 90% compliance. And once we did that, our survival to hospital discharge in our hospital went up to 51% survival. What was really interesting was that about 90% of those children who survived had good, favorable neurologic outcome. So it wasn't just that that quality of CPR was affecting survival, it was that it was affecting survival with favorable neurologic outcome, which I think is critically important. Now the problem is that it's very hard to maintain that level of training maintain that excellent CPR. I wonder if I could turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. Could you first please state your city and country location? And the question is this, does your pediatric intensive care unit require basic life support training um, as part of the credentialing process in your pediatric intensive care unit? And if so, how frequently must recertification training take place? And the second question is, does your pediatric intensive care unit require that the physicians undergo advanced training in pediatric resuscitation? And if so, how frequently must the recertification take place? We're back now with Dr. Nard Carney. Uh, Vinay, what is the evidence, either guidelines or evidence, about how often we should, and, and what should we be certified, and how often should we, we be uh, recertified in the pediatric intensive care unit environment? Jeff, that's uh, probably the area that ILCOR is going to have the most to say about. There have been no magic bullets or drugs or therapies that have really, um, over the past five years, changed the basic resuscitation. But the quality of CPR and the training requirements are the ones that are most likely to see pretty dramatic changes. We currently, just like the American Heart Association recommends, require training in basic life support, CPR, and advanced life support, pediatric advanced life support, every two years. When you say we, is that ILCOR or is that Children's Hospital of Philadelphia? Both ILCOR and the American Heart Association have found that that interval, by consensus, was what was recommended. But we're in the process of evaluating the literature and there's some very interesting things coming down the pike there is a recognition that within about three to six months after a training course for advanced life support, 
that the skills of life support for most practitioners degrade and that the quality comes down to a level that we wouldn't be proud of. For basic life support, it's an even shorter half-life. If you actually, we actually did this, we roll up to the bedside of a patient who's at risk to arrest and we assess the skills of the bedside providers in perfect CPR, deep enough, fast enough, full release, no overventilation, and no interruptions when they do switchovers. And what we find is that within 90 days, their skills tend to degrade. And so with a little booster, we call it rolling refreshers, we roll the cart up, they boost for two minutes of practice, then we can keep their skills just like a booster shot, very good, excellent. And when we actually measure the impact of this rolling refresher of retraining frequently for a very short piece of time, just in time before the patient will, that our quality of our real CPR took a big boost. And when we measured that quality in the patients, it actually met the criteria for excellent CPR. And when it met excellent CPR criteria, survival was improved, significantly improved. So this has now been repeated in a number of circumstances on the pediatric wards, in other pediatric ICUs, and in a network of pediatric ICUs in simulation across Canada. With those results, we're finding that a frequent refresher program is most likely gonna be needed to keep our skills where they are. It's not quite at the point yet, at the tipping point, where the heart association or ill core is ready yet to make that a firm recommendation because they don't want to require people to train more frequently than they really need to, but it's getting stronger and stronger. And the important thing is that if you measure the quality of CPR, if you measure the quality of CPR that you're delivering in your unit, you'll be able to know when and how to train. And I'll guarantee that it's more frequently than every two years. Veena, could I ask you about this just-in-time training? I've, I've heard about it, and I know you've been doing that at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in your PICU for some time now. Could you explain to us how this works? Um, how do you identify uh, which patients in, in uh, whom to practice this uh, just-in-time training? Um, how often do you do it? And um, I can't help but wonder, what do you explain to the parents when they see uh, resuscitation being practiced outside the door of their critically ill child? <laughs> Those are really good questions. What we've come up with is uh, a screening tool that basically uh, started out by walking by the bedsides of kids and you could see that there were five IV pumps on the pole and you could see that they were on an oscillator or on ECMO or that there were a ton of practitioners in the room who were circling around the bedside. And then we, we refined that and we sort of figured out that even from our electronic medical record, we could derive the mean airway pressure, we could derive the number of vasopressors, we could number, derive the number of pumps that were at the bedside. And so we have a very simple tool that we can share with you that screens patient with a high degree of sensitivity for cardiac arrest, but not much specificity. So that we can then roll up to those bedsides and prepare those bedside providers, predominantly the nurse and doctor who are taking care of that patient that day, to be prepared for the worst event that could happen for that child, cardiac arrest. So we then roll that card up and right outside the door, they pop out, and for about less than two minutes, they rehearse until they can provide a perfect strip on the mannequin. Just a little rehearsal, rolling refresher. And then we uh, actually track that and give them credit for that for their basic life support training. So essentially it's banked, and through a learning management system, that can avoid them having to go to a sim center or go to a course to retrain, because they've demonstrated they can do it at the bedside. Now, from there, we then um, collect that data during the cardiac arrest event. And at the end of the arrest, we can get right from our monitor defibrillator a summary, a report card of how they did. How many compressions were deep enough, fast enough? How many interruptions did they have? How long were they? That data, along with a download from the bedside monitors, like the waveforms of the pressures and the end tidal CO2, can then be stored and analyzed. And we put together a little PowerPoint, a very simple little report card in PowerPoint. And then under quality improvement conditions, the end of the week, we'll review any resuscitation that we did, actually showing the uh, waveforms, the pauses, the things they did well, the things that maybe they could improve on. And by discussing it openly, everybody kind of refreshes on what they should be doing during an arrest. It works really well.
And as you noted, the screening tool is available upon request. Uh, you'd be willing to share this? For sure. Uh, can, perhaps we could flash it now to, uh, to our audience. It's on the screen right now. Sure. Vinay, the uh, process you use to identify these patients sounds like almost a scoring system. Um, have you published this approach uh, in the literature? Yes, Jeff. Actually, we, um, we sort of took the idea of an early warning score like we use for rapid response teams or medical emergency response teams, and we tried to sort of create the same paradigm for the patients in the hospital. Now, unfortunately, we don't have really sensitive tools, uh, which we would like to have, that we can actually bring down um, based on evidence that will predict cardiac arrest. So we had to resort to sort of a consensus process to develop this uh, if you will, this list, this checklist of risk factors that are sensitive for cardiac arrest but not very specific. We published that, um, that process and the whole rolling refresher process um, not too long ago. And then the other thing we did was we started to try to find other processes in the ICU that that might apply to. And we lit on um, central line uh, associated bloodstream infections. And so what we do is we have what we call a dress rehearsal cart, which anybody who needs a, a, dress, a dressing change for their central line, we would actually roll a cart up and have to go through the whole policy and procedure with a bedside nurse who's going to change the dressing on the central line. And in that manner, we were able to uh, cut our central line infections by a third. But it really was the process of pre-identification of just-in-time practice of real-time feedback and then after event review. That type of approach that sports teams use, the type of instant replay that we use that was the impetus to both practice just before an event, warm up if you will, and then after the event, discuss what you did, critique it, and do better the next time. It's a very innovative approach. Do you do that on every single uh, center line um, change or is it only as a refresher uh, so that uh, you periodically do it, but not every single time? Because wouldn't that be doubling the work of the bedside nurse? So in fact, uh, that's a good question. Uh, during a very discreet time period, we were doing it on every single dressing. But then we started to examine whether repeatedly doing it actually improved practice further, and we found that it didn't. So now, if you've rehearsed in the last 90 days, you don't have to do it again to try to save time and improve efficiency at the bedside. But Jeff, the concept really isn't that this is extra work or education. That's the old way of thinking about it. I think what we have to do is embed, embed this type of pre-identification practice and after event review into our practice. We actually think that this is part of patient care, not extra, not education. If you can't, identify the patient at risk. If you can't train just before you do it, demonstrate that you know what you're doing and can do it well, and then review your practice right after and can't demonstrate that you can do it, then you shouldn't be doing it. V and I, we've been talking about the pre-arrest stage, cardiac arrest, quality of CPR, and of course now our colleagues wanna know about uh, post-arrest stabilization and what the literature shows and what the guidelines shows. And we have, as you know, so many questions about temperature, blood pressure, uh, glucose, ventilation, seizure control. Could you take us through what uh, the evidence tells us and what the guidelines tell us about optimal management of the patient in the post-stabilization phase after cardiac arrest? This is, I think, the area, this post-resuscitation period that we have the most opportunity to improve on. It's been kind of a black box. There are a lot of associations uh, of just the elements you mentioned. So temperature, avoiding hyperthermia, really important. We'll come back to that in a minute. But also blood pressure, a single drop in blood pressure that's documented in the first six hours after resuscitation from cardiac arrest is associated with worse outcome in adults and in kids. Now these are mostly from retrospective summaries of large data sets. Now in addition, glucose control associated with outcome, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia associated with worse outcome. But we don't yet have a study that looks at control of blood glucose after cardiac arrest and whether that makes a difference. But in addition, the carbon dioxide norm, normocarbia, normal ventilation, and normoxia, so 
temperature, blood pressure, and then at least for adults, not having periods of hyperoxia, too much oxygen, has led to a change in the titration of oxygen after cardiac arrest because of the risk for generating superoxide and free radical damage. Now, in children, that association of a PaO2 of greater than 300, or very high PaO2 levels, for any length of time is not as strong as the association that's seen in adults. But there certainly is concern. And when we look at the neonatal paradigm, there's a lot of preclinical work and some clinical work that really suggests that room air is better than 100% oxygen in terms of the free radical damage and actually the neurologic outcome of those neonates. So neonates start with room air and then after resuscitation, a tight titration, 94% to 98% SAT. In children and adults, 100% oxygen during resuscitation, but immediately after return of spontaneous circulation, close attention to the pulse oximeter to make sure that we're not getting 100% oxygen saturation because we might be a very high PaO2. For how long should this uh, be maintained in the post-stabilization, uh, post-arrest phase? Well, that is a very good question. We know experimentally that for up to 48 hours after reperfusion, the risk of injury and superoxide damage is greatest. In humans, and particularly in children, we don't really know how high or how long. The timing, the intensity, the duration, and the variability of all of these measures is probably important. But we don't have enough data yet to really give you a specific time frame or a specific height or depth or duration that's really important. So the guidelines are a little silent on that because we just don't have the data yet. Well, Veena, I, I can't help but wonder myself, and I'm, I suspect I speak for our colleagues, what do you do in your own practice? Mm -hmm. So at CHOP, uh, you're in the post-arrest uh, phase, you're in the stabilization phase. What do you do with uh, how do you target uh, the PaO2, the oxygen saturations, and for how long? So that's a really good question, and I'll tell you my practice. So um, immediately after arrest, and we have return of spontaneous circulation, I really focus attention on the blood flow first, and I say I don't want any episode of hypotension. So I make sure that the preload is adequate, fluid bolus if necessary, and I make sure that even if they're not currently needing vasopressors like epinephrine, norepinephrine, that I have it in line and ready to go so that I can give them support, vasopressor support, if needed to avoid or immediately treat any hypotension I see. Now, I make sure that there's a pulse oximeter that's working and picking up and correlating. And I titrate the oxygen to between 94 and 98%. 94% because I want a little bit of luxury before I get into hypoxia and the risk for not delivering enough oxygen, but 98% because I don't want to risk over-delivering oxygen and creating free radical damage. So for a period of 24 hours after cardiac arrest resuscitation, I'll tightly manage that PO2 and tightly manage guided by saturation. Now the CO2 story is a little bit difficult. And a lot of that, personally, I titrate to the condition of the child before arrest. So if this is a child with ARDS who were using permissive hypercapnia and was used to a PCO2 of maybe 55 or 60, I'll target that pre-arrest carbon dioxide that I was targeting previously for that child because their pH had been normalized to that. They had been acclimatized to it. Otherwise, if they had a normal PCO2 before the arrest, then I will target a normal PCO2 after the arrest as well. Hyperventilation, which is quite frequently, when we measure it about 25% of the time within the first six hours, blood gases that are sent frequently reflect an arterial hypocarbia, PCO2 of 20 to 25. And uh, so I try to assure that our CO2 is in the normal range because of the risk of cerebral vasoconstriction with a low PAO, uh, PCO2. And because it may be a time period where we don't want to necessarily restrict blood flow to areas of potentially damaged brain. Now, that brings us then to glucose, which almost always goes very high. So almost always because of the stress response, we see an initial hyperglycemia 
but um, I try to avoid not administering a glucose-containing fluid because I'd rather use glucose and insulin to drive the contractility and the, uh, the sugar back into the cells where, they're, where it's needed. The tendency is to avoid glucose administration. And again, this is my practice, not a, um, not a guideline from the Heart Association or ILCOR. But the use of glucose and insulin is actually a very interesting sort of presser effect on the heart. And so uh, paying attention to glucose, I think, is the message. How you manage it is still very controversial. And so, again, you're referring to, to uh, improve um, inotropic support um, with the, these uh, metabolic uh, agents, as it were. And actually, one of the really important things to know is that very reliably, after a cardiac arrest of chest compressions greater, defined as chest compressions for greater than two minutes, we find very reliably, both in the animal lab, experimentally, and in human adults, children, and infants, that there is, within six hours, a uh, poor contractility. There's a myocardial dysfunction in the post-arrest phase that can be treated with vasopressors. And it's that sag in myocardial performance that we're trying to avoid. Unfortunately, in the pig lab, prophylaxis with vasopressors doesn't work. It still comes about. So responding to it rapidly is why I have those vasopressors in line and the iatrips in line. And temperature control? Temperature control is, right now, uh, I, I would target therapeutic normothermia. In other words, an active targeted temperature management, uh, usually to about 36 and a half degrees, and avoidance of any fever, any temperature above 37 and a half. Now, uh, the jury's still out on whether we should be inducing hypothermia to 33 degrees target. Um, because of the large trials out of hospital and in hospital, FAPCA, that where the results are still pending. But it's pretty clear that an active targeted temperature management to avoid hyperthermia is helpful and has very little risk. Vinay, um, could I probe you a little further about support, support for the failing myocardium in the immediate uh, post-arrest phase? Um, we often use the terms, you know, vasopressor, things like that. And um, I, I know that uh, you were very descriptive on uh, the science, which shows that there's a decline in ventricular function and cardiac output. And so the question becomes, what's the best way to support that? And of course, it's not to raise systemic vascular resistance. And so could I push you further on how you support the low cardiac output state um, in these hours after cardiac arrest? That's really a good question because there's this balance. As the myocardium is failing and what we see post-cardiac arrest is that there's decreased contractility. So you really do want an inotrope to be included. But in addition, the diastolic blood pressure is critically important to perfuse the myocardium. So the myocardial perfusion pressure is really the diastolic blood pressure minus the right atrial pressure, the central venous pressure. So having a, maintaining a diastolic blood pressure of above 30 becomes critically important. So oftentimes we use a combination of an inotrope and a vasopressor. So something to improve the squeeze of the heart, contractility, but something also to increase the afterload a little bit, titrated, so that our diastolic pressure stays above 30. It's a delicate balance. And I'm not sure I know exactly how to do that, but I usually will use a combination of either epinephrine and sometimes norepinephrine or dobutamine and norepinephrine. And the reason I choose those is that uh, Berg and the group in Arizona that studied this in the lab found that dobutamine and norepinephrine was the best combination for post-arrest myocardial dysfunction, at least in a pig model, an, a an adult model and particularly when the onset was ventricular fibrillation, so an electrical cause of cardiac arrest. So that titration of improving contractility with an inotrope and then titrating the afterload with a vasopressor to maintain an adequate myocardial perfusion pressure are really, for me, the main targets. Down the road, everybody always wants to start milrinone. Everybody wants to start a lucitrope or something that improves the relaxation of the heart for heart failure. But the problem with that is that if, it, if you add that and it vasodilates and drops your diastolic pressure, you frequently will see dysrhythmias and worse myocardial function because the myocardial perfusion pressure isn't being preserved. So is it safe to say that you're adding an um, alpha adrenergic agent 
to uh, treat low systemic vascular resistance um, so that there's not a drop in the diastolic blood pressure and the coronary perfusion pressure, but that you're not adding an alpha adder adrenergic agent to elevate systemic vascular resistance. Is that a fair summation? Exactly. And I'm that? using my diastolic blood pressure to sort of titrate or guide that so it's neither too low nor too high because the back pressure pumping against high afterload is not a good thing for a recently arrested heart either. Now, the other question that comes up is um, many of our colleagues around the world take care of older children or even uh, adults um, uh, in their 20s or perhaps older. And of course, in the adult world, uh, thrombolysis uh, would be considered, and, and indeed in a few patients that we would be caring for, thrombolysis may be indicated, but certainly that would be a very small minority of these patients. But how do you think about that in the context of the uh, patient in the pediatric uh, intensive care unit after cardiac arrest. Jeff, it's really clear that for adults, <clears throat> adults who have a sudden witness cardiac arrest, and when that's due to a ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, a shockable rhythm, those patients are extremely high risk to have some form of coronary anomaly or coronary blockage. And so those patients go to the cath lab, uh, particularly if they exhibit elevated ST segments, STEMI. Uh, because the, there's a very high frequency of a blockage that needs to be repaired. Now, that's pretty rare in kids. Remember, only about 7 to 10 percent of out-of-hospital children with cardiac arrest present with a shockable rhythm, and maybe 10 to 15 percent in the hospital, even including the congenital heart disease population. So the number of kids that need to go to the cath lab for percutaneous interventions or for thrombolysis, exceedingly small, except in the special resuscitation circumstance, of a first documented rhythm of ventricular fibrillation and elevated ST segments. There's probably more to come on this story because in the adult world, they're taking a lot of patients to the cath lab, even those with asystole and PEA, and they're finding some lesions. So in the future, we may find out that there are perhaps more patients that would benefit from going to the cath lab. But for right now, it's still pretty rare in kids. Vinay, you've been very clear uh, that you're sharing with us your personal practice and that these are not ILCOR or American Heart Association guidelines on glucose management and that we, uh, or, or temperature control, that we eagerly re, re, uh, await uh, further research to guide us on those. Um, could I ask you a question about your practice on temperature control? I find that in our patients, um, we too uh, do everything we can to prevent hyperthermia, but the question is how? Um, if you don't uh, deploy anything, they often spike a fever and then it's too late. On the other hand, um, it's often difficult to know what to do. Cooling blankets can lead to problems with systemic vascular resistance. Uh, should you be giving pharmacologic agents to uh, prevent a temperature spike? What do you do in your practice at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to regulate temperature? So uh, we use a targeted temperature management for everybody. And what we would do is first get a reliable measure of the temperature, of the core temperature. So we tend to use a, a bladder catheter, a Foley catheter that has a temperature monitor on it. And uh, we also will use an esophageal temperature probe for, so we have two points of core temperature to compare. Uh, our rectal temperature monitoring has been unreliable, uh, partly because the perfusion of the gut is not always so good and sometimes gives you a falsely low temperature compared to the heart and brain, which is what we're really trying to measure, and also because it frequently will sometimes fall out of the rectum and then be measuring sort of a room temperature rather than the core temperature of the patient. So we find two reliable. Uh, we use bladder, as I said, and esophageal. Some people will use tympanic because it's near the brain or even pharyngeal temperature as guides. Once we have a guide, then we use uh, convective cooling. So we use cooling blanket under the patient, a cooling blanket over the patient. And interestingly enough, in children and even adolescents, these convective techniques work just as well as the intravascular cooling techniques that are often advocated in adults. And so we're able to maintain a pretty tight control with servo control of those two cooling blankets. The nurses frequently find it easier to nurse the patients with a patient uncovered, and they tend to want to take that top blanket off which leads to a wide variability in cooling and a sort of oscillation around too cool, too warm, too cool, too warm. And so by keeping them sort of sandwiched in between those two cooling blankets, we're able to attain a pretty, attain a pretty smooth uh, targeted temperature management. Now, uh, 
if we cool the patient um, on trial, uh, the cooling process induces shivering, so we have to pay attention to that and uh, at least provide some sedation. Sometimes dexmedetomidine will prevent the, sh the shivering, but if the shivering is increasing the metabolic demand of the muscles and, in fact, the brain, then we need to use a paralytic and, of course, assure that the patient is adequately sedated when we're using it. After the duration of cooling and rewarming, we have to pay attention to the vasodilatation as we raise the temperature, the diuresis, and in particular seizures. At this point of rewarming, we found with continuous EEG monitoring in our last 100 cardiac arrest patients that there is a much higher incidence of seizures, of status epilepticus, during that rewarming phase. It's not so much during the cooling phase, but during rewarming, which we find very interesting and has induced us to monitor these patients continuously with EEG during that course of post-resuscitation care. How long do you maintain uh, temperature regulation? We don't know exactly what the right duration is. And I'd be interested to hear what people around the world are doing. We do that for five days. So we will cool them generally if they're in the cooling protocol or the normothermia protocol will control the temperature actively for five days. And that's mostly based on uh, animal evidence that um, the benefits of cooling are best when preceding the hypoxic ischemic event, done during the event or as soon after the event, and then main, maintained for a period of up to five days after. And uh, although the beneficial effects tail off, as it gets longer and longer during the experimental studies, uh, there still is a small benefit out to about five days after. And uh, that also is the highest risk when you actually look at patients for the development of fever after a uh, inflammatory or hypoxic ischemic event. Is it safe to summarize it that um, during those five days, you're maintaining temperature regulation in order to prevent uh, fever? Or is it because you're still actively cooling them during those five days? No, it's really uh, to prevent fever for those first five days. And really, um, I would say our general practice is right now targeted to achieve normothermia, preventing fever for that first five days. And we're really now just studying whether it should be at a, say, 36.7 versus a 33 degree uh, period. It's that active, uh, what you said before, though, was that uh, waiting for the fever to occur doesn't seem to work very well. Once they have that fever, it's much harder to get it down. But uh, we use acetaminophen, IV acetaminophen, to, uh, to sort of prevent fever, if you will, to have it on board. And then we'll use that active cooling to um, use the environmental cooling to try to bring it down. What's really interesting is in the lab, there are some uh, chemical hibernators. There's some chemical agents that may be in the future used for uh, maintaining hypothermia or normothermia, preventing fever. We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. Could you first tell us your city and country that you're located in? And the question is this, in the pediatric patient in your pediatric intensive care unit after cardiac arrest, do you actively attempt to maintain a temperature less than 37.5 degrees centigrade? If so, for how many days do you maintain this temperature regulation? Um, Dr. Narcani, I know that you're one of the principal investigators in an NIH-funded study that's going on in the United States and Europe that's looking at these questions of who do we cool, how long do we cool, how much cooling do we deploy, and what do we do about rewarming? And that's the FAPCA trial, and we all eagerly uh, await the results of that trial. And in the meantime, is it safe to summarize all of this research up to this time before publication of FAPCA? that the most important thing to do is to avoid fever in these pediatric patients post-cardiac arrest, and in particular, avoid any temperature greater than 37.5 degrees uh, centigrade or Celsius. Is that a fair summation of where we are right now? Yeah, I think the therapeutic hypothermia after pediatric cardiac arrest trials will answer some questions, but those questions you just mentioned are critically important, and the active targeted temperature management to avoid hyperthermia or fever is really where we're at right now, and that's what we know works and works well. And it's, uh, it's hard to do, but it's important to do. Uh, the last topic I'd like to ask you about is um, ECMO. Uh, 
for many years, uh, ECMO was uh, a, a, a very uh, expensive modality, uh, limited to a few centers, and um, it had a particular purpose related to resuscitation in uh, newborns with persistent fetal circulation or uh, pulmonary uh, hypoplasia. And um, in the past 15, 20 years, there's been an expansion at some centers to using ECMO as part of eCPR. And the question becomes this, it's, um, as I noted, as you know, it's an expensive modality. Uh, it requires trained personnel uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and uh, should it be part of our practice in um, pediatric ICUs around the world that are responsible for resuscitating children? Uh, what do we know about the evidence of the cost benefit, quite frankly, mm -hmm. of eCPR, ECMO, as part of that chain of resuscitation? Well, that's a really tough question, Jeff. Um, remember way back, we used to do open chest CPR, you know, crack the chest and squeeze. And that provided really, really good blood flow, excellent CPR. But the cost and the survival was really poor. And so we went away from that. Now we have ECMO. And we know that there are certain circumstances before arrest in certain congenital heart conditions where ECMO is just life-saving and really makes a difference. eCPR, the institution of ECMO during cardiac arrest, during chest compressions, has been quite successful in centers where rapid deployment ECMO, where the, the tools and the practice and the availability is very readily available. Does that mean that everybody should or needs to have an ECMO program or needs to be able to provide eCPR? I don't think so. I think what it means is that in centers, and this is what Ilcor says, in fact, that in centers that have that capability, it may be an important rescue tool, particularly when good quality CPR, good quality CPR, and good advanced life support with reversible, the treatment of reversible conditions, a pneumothorax, a hemothorax, a tamponade have been attempted and can have been exhausted. Under those conditions for children who have reversible processes, there's some really good results with eCPR. But I'm not sure that really means that we're saying that every program has to have eCPR if they're going to take care of sick kids. And in your practice at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, if there is no return of spontaneous circulation despite optimal uh, resuscitation techniques, after how many minutes do you deploy um, ECMO as part of this eCPR program? So at our hospital, we uh, generally will activate the ECMO team for in-hospital CPR at the time of the arrest, that chest compressions are initiated, because it takes a little time for them to gather. We're not quite as quick as they are at Boston Children's. But in other words, we will initiate the process of gathering the personnel. We will provide chest compressions and attempt to do excellent basic life support and cure reversible causes with advanced cardiac life support for up to 20 minutes. At 20 minutes, we begin the cannulation process. Again, with a caveat that we hopefully have pre-screened the children that the CPR is being done to decide if they're ECMO candidates or not. And I wanna emphasize that most of the reported literature on eCPR has done some form of pre-screening or some sort of decision-making for those children that if they arrest, that eCPR or these heroic efforts are to be done because they potentially have a reversible cause of their arrest. So that as we interpret the literature, we have to be a little bit careful of looking at excellent eCPR results and, and uh, interpreting it as across the board that eCPR would be as successful as it is. But it is quite successful and one of the things that we've learned that I think is really important is that it's not really the total duration of CPR that a child receives that is highly associated with their outcome. Obviously, longer is a little worse than shorter, but that we can sustain children with excellent CPR for a long duration, 60 to 90 minutes sometimes, and especially with ECMO rescue, we can have some really good results. So on the screen now, we see your cardiac arrest screening tool, and uh, thank you. Is it safe to say, Vinay, you'd be willing to share this with colleagues around the world? Absolutely. The more people and the better we can refine it in the future, better for all of us. Terrific. Um, Vinay, of course, the last question on all our minds is, um, 
long-term neurologic outcome. Yeah. That, of course, is uh, the bottom line of uh, resuscitation. What do we know from research uh, to this moment about long-term neurologic outcome in pediatric patients after cardiac arrest? Um, we, we know that the gross neurologic function can they function in society? Do they learn? Do they go to school, et cetera? It's actually pretty good for survivors of cardiac arrest. Now, recognizing that's a selected population, those that we select to receive CPR, if you will. But on discharge from the hospital, about 80% of children who survive to hospital discharge have good neurologic function. That relates to a, a pediatric cerebral performance category of one or two. So very good outcome. Uh, and we know that, interestingly enough, if we track them out to a year after, that there's very little loss of those neurologic milestones. So the favorable neurologic outcome at a year is about 75% for survivors of hospital discharge, much better than we thought. The problem is we're very poor at measuring subtle executive function problems, neurologic issues like attention deficit, and even memory loss and school performance. There just haven't been many long-term outcome studies that address that. And in adults, the quality of life is affected by these executive functions, memory, et cetera. And so uh, we can say that their gross neurologic function is quite good, surprisingly good, 75 to 80% good outcome, but that their minor problems that they're experiencing has not been well enough characterized, and that's an area for future research. Terrific. Dr. Nard Carney, um, it's been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, as I said at the beginning, your colleagues around the world have admired you for decades on the, um, the research you've done in this field, and we thank you for sharing it with us today here in Boston. It's a pleasure. Thank you.